Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode number 244 of the Healthy Skin Show. In today's episode, we are going to talk about biologic drugs and how they work. What are the mechanisms and what do you need to know, especially when you're faced with a decision about whether a biologic drug is the next best step for you? That way you can make a more informed decision about whether you do or don't want to go that route and you can ask more educated questions of your providers. So again, the idea is to help support you through this process and give you some pros and cons, but everything based on how these drugs actually work. My guest today is Dr. Heather Zwicky. She earned her PhD in immunology and microbiology from the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. She went on to complete a postdoctoral fellowship and teach medical school at Yale University. At the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon, Dr. Zwicky launched the Health Got Research Institute and established the School of Graduate Studies, developing programs in research, nutrition, and global health, among others. Dr. Zwicky applies her immunology expertise to natural medicine research, and she currently leads an NIH-funded clinical research training program. She teaches at many universities and speaks at conferences worldwide and I feel so lucky that she is a recurring guest here on the Healthy Skin Show. So without further ado, let's jump into today's conversation. Dr. Zwicky, it is such a pleasure to have you back on the show. Thank you so much for being here again. Hi, Jen. I'm really happy to be here. I know. Every time you come on the show, I feel like I learn so much. Some of my favorite episodes are of you breaking down some complex scientific topics. And I felt like the conversation today about biologic drugs, what they are, how do they work, how we maybe should or shouldn't think about them. um, I felt like you were the right person to have this conversation with. So I really appreciate it. And I I think the most important question that I have for you to just kick off this whole conversation are what exactly what exactly are biologic drugs and how do they work? Yeah, that's a great question. And in order to address that question, we first have to talk about what is a cytokine. So cytokines are these proteins that your immune system makes to communicate with the rest of the body. And you can think of them as a hormone of the immune system. You have cytokines that are inflammatory that tell the rest of your body, hey, this person has an infection and we need to start an immune response. And you have cytokines that are anti anti-inflammatory that tell the rest of your body, hey, everything's good right now. We need to calm down. And what happens in a lot of inflammatory diseases and skin diseases in particular is that the inflammatory cytokines are dysregulated. And often the reason they're dysregulated has to do with the microbes in our gut and on our skin and that they're out of balance. And so the immune system is saying, hey, there's, there's, an infection when really the infection is our normal microbes overgrowing or undergrowing, but it's leading our immune system astray and telling our immune system to send out an inflammatory signal. Now, what biologics do, which is very different than some of the previous drugs that we had for for skin diseases, um, what biologics do is they target individual cytokines. So we can say, hey, this particular cytokine is out of balance, and we are going to pinpoint that cytokine, and we're going to block it. And, And so the early classes of biologics were blocking individual cytokines like TNF-alpha or um, more recently IL-17. We also have biologics that block interleukin-1. The cool thing about that is that 
because you're only targeting an individual cytokine, it has less of the broad-based side effects that the earlier medications had. Back when we used things like methotrexate for skin disorders, we would see that the entire immune system was blocked. And as a result, there would be side effects of things like cancer. When we're only blocking one protein, we have much less severe side effects. Does that make I sense? See. So this is a more, sele- yeah, so this is basically a more selective way, a more like Jedi way of sneakily exactly. modulating the immune system, essentially. Yeah. Instead of sending in an atomic bomb, you're sending in a sniper. You're still going to do some damage because you're wiping out a protein that your body needs, but you're not going to do nearly the amount of damage that we were doing with the early immunoinhibitory proteins. Okay. And so with cytokines, like we have cytokines, which you just mentioned, that people and and drug companies have been targeting, we'll say, but now there's JAK inhibitors. And you'll see the term the JAK stat pathway. Are the cytokines the same thing as the JAK stat pathway? Are they a part of the pathway? Like what is the difference between those two camps, I guess we'll say? Sure. The cytokines are on the outside of the cell. So they're they're extracellular. And where a cytokine works is that the cell will have a receptor, which kind of looks like a baseball mitt. And then the cytokine can bind to that receptor. So it's like a baseball hitting the mitt. The JAK-STAT pathways are inside the cell. So if you imagine catching a baseball and your arm jabs backwards, that is going to send a signal. You're jabbing the cell, sending a signal into the cell to turn it on to do different things. So the JAK stat pathways are signaling proteins, and they're similar in that they're in the same pathways as the cytokine receptors, but they tend to be more general. They can be associated with several different cytokines, whereas the cytokines are more sniperish, more individual. This episode is brought to you by my line of professional grade supplements called NutriQuel. I crafted these supplements, especially for those struggling with chronic skin rash issues and based the formulations on my extensive research and clinical experience in my private practice. They are made from the highest quality ingredients and tested to be free of different allergens so that you can support your gut, liver, and overall health with the formulas that I found work best for my skin rash warrior clients without triggering a flare. I'm excited to share them with you. So check them out at quellshop.com and use the coupon code GET15OFF to get 15% off your first order. I'll put a link in the description below. And now let's jump back to the video. And the JAKSTAT pathway or the JAK inhibitors are now being considered like the newest thing though. So it's like they're looking to almost go broader in trying to block the inflammation. They are. Um, So the idea with using JAKSTAT pathway is is not that it is going to have less side effects because they still have side effects. It's that they're worried about blocking individual cytokines because of some of the side effects that show up. So if you look at the side effects that happen with the IL-23 inhibitors, you'll see that usually the reason IL-23 is made is when we are exposed to mold or we have fungal infections. And so then your immune system turns on the IL-23, IL-17 pathway to fight mold. If you now block that pathway, that means that anytime you're exposed to black mold in your house or mold in the air, you can get these fungal infections. Likewise, you're more likely to get candida in um, your genitals and that sort of thing. So anything that is a mold or fungus 
is going to be allowed to grow when you block that pathway. In contrast, if you use a JAK-STAT inhibitor, it's a broader effect, so you're not seeing the same fungal infections, but what you do see is nausea and headaches and, um, and some infections that come out like herpes infections that are usually suppressed by your immune system. So it's a general, a more general suppressor of the immune system. It's not as general as methotrexate, but it's more general than the targeted biologics of the IL-17, IL-23, or the TNF-alpha inhibitors, or the IL-4, IL-13 for, for atopic um, dermatitis. So it sounds like the issues that we're so concerned about in using biologic drugs specifically cytokines and whatnot, they're not necessarily bad things. I mean, you just literally shared <laughs> that mm -hmm. some of these are meant to protect us. They're actually helpful for the oh, body, and are. yet there is consequence. Right. So there's a consequence to turning them off. Would those be considered the side effects that are listed within the pamphlet or the brochure for whatever specific medication you're taking? Absolutely. So when you're reading the side effects, it'll tell you what that cytokine usually does. So for example, the TNF-alpha inhibitors, one of the big side effects is um, tuberculosis. That if you're in a place where tuberculosis is endemic and you take a TNF-alpha inhibitor, you're going to get tuberculosis and you're not going to be able to fight it off. So um, all of these cytokines have very specific biological activities and things that they're good for. Now, what's interesting for the atopic dermatitis is that the cytokines that are blocked, they're IL-4 and IL-13, those cytokines historically are what we use to fight worm infections. Like we would, we grew up with worms in our guts, right? That's, that's, normal microbiota in most of the world, but in the Western industrialized world, we have figured out how to kill those worms. And so we don't have worms in our guts anymore, but we grew up having worms in our guts, um, evolutionarily. And so we made these cytokines in order to keep the worms in our gut under control. Now, if you block them, if you're in a location where worms are endemic, you're gonna have out of control worm infections. In the United States, the only worms that really circulate around here are pinworms, and usually you see them in daycare centers, um, but we don't really have worms anymore. So when we block IL-4 and IL-13, we don't see worm infections happening. I was just gonna say, cause um, with Dupixent, they have a specific warning about checking to make sure if you have a Helmuth infection. And That's a worm I infection. could never understand <laughs> quite, yeah. <laughs> and, but the funny thing is it's hard for one to probably know if they have a Helmuth infection if nobody ever checks, right? Yes, that is very true. Although there are very few helminths that are circulating in the U.S. other than pinworm. So the likelihood that you have a helminth or a worm infection is very low here. Likewise in Europe, where we see worms still endemic is sub-Saharan Africa, much of South America, um, and and so those places using a, a drug like Dupixent is going to be a much higher risk. I see, I see. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Do you wanna hear something really cool? Yes, please. So interleukin-13, <laughs> I geek out on this stuff, of course. So interleukin-13 is um, one of the cytokines that is blocked for atopic dermatitis. And the role of interleukin-13 is mucus production. So when you produce interleukin-13 in your body, you're making mucus so that the worms can't hold on in your gut and you expel them. Now, because we don't have worms, we make IL-13 to innocuous antigens. It's made when we have allergies. And so when we sneeze and we expel all of that mucus, that's IL-13. When your nose is running because you have allergies, that's IL-13. So if you're taking an IL-13 inhibitor for your atopic dermatitis, the side effect is going to be that your allergies go away. Kind of a good side effect for that one. Well, I know with also with Dupixent, it's been cleared for use with asthma, I believe. 
And one of my clients, I had said, asked her, I said, do you want to talk to your doctor about possibly stepping down off of this? And she's like, well, it was so helpful with my asthma. I don't think I'm ready to try that yet. I was like, okay, no problem. <laughs> yes, that's right. The same cytokines that are involved in allergies are also involved in asthma. So when you block those um those particular cytokines, and in the, the case of Dupixin, it's two, it's IL-4 and IL-13, then not only are you blocking the atopic dermatitis, you're also blocking um, rhinitis, your, your runny nose, and you're blocking asthma. And in some countries, Dupixin is used for asthma, um, sorry, for asthma as well as for atopic dermatitis and allergies. So it has multiple effects because you're blocking these two cytokines. And unless you have worms, that's not a bad thing. Um, it used to be thought that some people had genetic polymorphisms or, or genetic reasons for expressing more of these cytokines. However, now we know that the reason that they probably are express, expressing more of these cytokines has to do with the microbes that, again, are on their skin, in their gut, in their lungs, and those microbes are out of balance. And their immune systems are trying to get those microbes back into balance, so the immune system is producing the IL-4 and the IL-13 and a third cytokine called IL-5 to try to bring everything back into balance. If you can bring those microbes back into balance with diet and exercise yeah. and you know, cleaning some of the environmental toxins out of your living area, then you can actually have the same effect of lowering those cytokines without actually using a drug to do it. And so this underscores why these are not bad. They're not actually bad. They're, they can be extremely helpful to support good health and life and protect your body as it is exposed to various different things. And so one thing I was reading that I thought you might find fascinating, there was a, a study, and I've seen this actually several times, where they're saying that like H. pylori, for example, can help increase IL-17 um, quite significantly. And so do you think that it might be helpful, or this is this is a good conversation for people who've thought, well, if I just do a biologic drug, I don't need to do anything else. I'm, I don't even know if they think that they're cured or healed or what somebody may think, because it depends a lot of times on to what education they're exposed to around these medications. Um, but that perhaps it's an opportunity to start digging deeper if a specific medication works for these specific. Uh, cytokines, for example, then maybe that's the opportunity to begin digging around what's driving that particular cytokine higher. I absolutely think that's the case. So I like to use the analogy of um, putting a piece of duct tape over your gas indicator. You know, you have the, the gas indicator that tells you whether or not you're running out of gas. And we can easily take care of that symptom by putting a piece of duct tape over it. Now you never have to worry anymore about looking at your gas indicator and seeing that you're running out of gas but it doesn't mean that you're not gonna still run out of gas. And that's a lot of what these medications do is they, they shut down a single pathway so that your symptom goes away. Your skin clears up or your rhinitis clears up and your nose doesn't run anymore, but you haven't treated really the underlying cause, which is the dysbiosis either on your skin or in your gut. We know that there's a gut-skin axis so that even if your, your gut is what is um, not functioning properly or what it has dysbiosis, it'll affect your skin and vice versa. If your skin is not um, in balance with its microbes, it will affect your gut. We really got to address that. That is the the root cause. And, and usually the way that we're going to address that is with eating more plant-based foods and getting some of the toxins out of our system and letting those microbes grow the way that they were supposed to grow in normal ecosystems. Yeah. 
with in in terms of these types of medications, um, like the Jack Stat in um, or Jack inhibitors. I keep wanting to say Jack Stat pathway, Jack inhib. So Jack inhibitor medications, um, they have a black box warning. Why is that? Why is that particular pathway like? Why why do you have to be careful with using those types of medications and messing with that pathway? Well, specifically for the the Jack Stats, they are um, they are proteins that regulate the cell cycle, and when you are messing with cell cycle, you can lead to cancer ultimately, right? Because we know that oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes are working together to keep our cells growing at a normal rate and not. Um, overgrowing or undergrowing. Jacks are what are called kinases. And as kinases, they mean, it means that they put a a phosphate onto a protein and make it active or, um, or inactive. And when we do that, we're causing the cell to go into an activation state or a growth cycle. And that those growth cycles could get out of control. So when you when you put a black box warning on a medication, you're recognizing that there are still things that may be long term consequences that have not been studied yet. And so we just don't know what the the real likelihood may be, like I guess long term with long term use, for example, of something like developing cancer. Exactly. So it takes like 20 years to develop cancer. And so we haven't done a 20 year clinical study on a JAK-STAT inhibitor, which means that it could still cause cancer. We just don't know yet. And we won't know until people have been taking them for more than 20 years. So we put a warning on it just in case, because of course, the, the other big thing is that none of these companies want to be sued. No, no. And I mean, I understand too that the intention is not to necessarily harm anyone, but I think sometimes we go in, um, and I saw this when in my dad's um, medical practice, that sometimes people don't want to even know what the potential side effects are because they're so afraid of them. They're like, I'd just rather not know. And that may or may not work for someone. <laughs> long term. (laughs) But I do, I personally am of the opinion, you really should weigh the pros and the cons and not assume that the like 2%, like it didn't impact that many people, like you could be the 2%. So you should weigh the pros and cons of whether you're, you're willing to possibly face that type of future ahead of you. It might not happen, but I think you should at least be aware and go in with your eyes open for these types of drugs. Because for some people, they're on them for a really long time. Is there any safety studies that we know of that like if you're on these drugs for 20, 30, 40 years, are they safe to be on them that long? We don't know. So the average clinical trial for any of these medications is uh, 12 to 36 weeks, which means that's as long as we've looked. People are on these things that's for not even years. A year. I know, I know. And, and people are on these things for years and that's why there's a black box warning there. We don't know what's going to happen when people are on these things for years. Wow. That is quite sobering. I mean, my point in having this conversation with you is not to scare anyone. I don't think that that's fair. I think that there is a time and a place for medications. Like I've I've worked with clients who are really, really suffering. And if they choose a medication along their journey to just help them get a better quality of life, to be able to get out and exercise because their joints are no longer hurting them or their skin is in open wounds and they're not in debilitating pain and up all night itching themselves. I mean, it can be a huge quality of life um, change for some people, but it there is that concern that long-term there, there are some possible 
there's some problems that could be ahead if you if you're not keeping your eyes open and also to not going to get probably regularly checked and making sure that nutrient levels are appropriate and whatnot. Um, just with your background in immunology, do you have any um, words of wisdom or advice for somebody who might be considering or who's on some sort of biologic um, about maybe what they could do to be proactive for themselves or to consider um, if they haven't quite made that decision yet to give it a shot? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing is to remember that your immune system changes over time as your body is changing over time. So pay attention to key times in, in your life pathways. If you are on a biologic and you're going through menopause, you're going to see shift in the biologic activity as you go through different stages of hormone cycles and pay attention because you may be at higher risk for different side effects as you're going through different phases of your life cycle. So that's the first thing. The second thing is as much as it, is, as it is tempting to say, I'm on a biologic, my medication completely controls my disease or my diagnosis, it's still really important to, to take care of the microbes that we live with because um, it is entirely possible that one of these biologics will be recalled when they see long-term side effects from them. And it would be really nice if you could come off the biologic and be healthy. So again, pay attention to taking care of these other aspects of your life as well. Just because the biologic is controlling the symptom doesn't mean that you don't still need to give your body those nutrients to make it healthy. And I think that's a really important reminder. Um, and I also think I, I'm just personally an advocate that before you go on a biologic, that you should really take a look at your nutrient levels and some other factors first, because I have worked with some clients who were offered a biologic and they just were like, let me just see if anything else is going on. And it turned out they had deficiencies in all different nutrient categories that they, that no one had ever bothered to look at. It just wasn't on their radar. And if they had gone on the biologic, some of those red flags that were showing up in their skin and their system would have disappeared, making them believe that they were completely healthy now as a result of that medication, even though in reality, their body needed cru crucial nutrients in order to thrive. So I think that there's yeah, exactly I, I think there's some some work to that can be done ahead of time before you make the choice. But again, it depends on one's access to things and what your also what your goals are in terms of your health. I would also say that remember that the side effects of the biologics are real. And you know, we get to the point in our family that when the commercials come on TV, we kind of laugh because they're listing so many different side effects. But the reason they're listing those side effects is people were experiencing those things. So if you go on an IL-17 biologic, as an example, pay attention to the fact that you may be susceptible to candida infection in your mouth, in your vagina, etc. And when those other symptoms start to appear, you're going to want to make sure you get them treated early because you don't want to go into recurrent candida infections and, and those sorts of things. When you go on a biologic, it's not an excuse to not pay attention anymore. You almost have to pay attention more. And, and just to underscore that, what you're saying is that, because I think this is important, even though you're on the medication for your skin, the infection, like a fungal infection in this instance, as you just mentioned, could be someplace else, not just on your skin. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, the the side effects specifically for um, anti-IL-17 in the phase three clinical trials, it was oral mucosa and vaginal mucosa and mild to moderate cases of candida anywhere between 12 and 60 weeks of treatment. So any time during a year of treatment, they were seeing these um, candida infections show up. Wow. 
Well, again, and underscoring the importance of the microbiome and making sure not just to shut things off, but to consider how do we better balance them and taking a lot of these other steps in order to get there. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Zwicky. I really appreciate you as always for coming back and breaking down some of these very complicated topics and enlightening all of us. And um, I'll, I'll make sure to put some of the ways that people can obviously connect with you in the show notes. And thank you so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And I hope our conversation helps people take good care of their bodies and nurture their microbiomes. I wanted to make sure that everyone listening to this knows that we're having a conversation generally about biologic drugs. So this can apply to certain drugs used for eczema or psoriasis and other conditions where biologic drugs are used. So hopefully that will help you in making a decision. This isn't a skin specific conversation. It's specific about a class of drugs that are used that act as biologic agents. And so hopefully you will have a better understanding of the pros and cons and why you do still have the option to work concurrently while on biologic drugs used using integrative or alternative therapies at the same time. And there always is the potential to wean off of that medication and potentially not have a flare up. I don't wanna say 100% of cases, you can absolutely get off medication and have no issue. But we have seen in our practice, because we work with a lot of individuals who are on biologic medications, where it gets the symptoms down to a level that makes things a lot more manageable and um, quality of life is much improved. And they can continue to work on all these other things and then eventually wean themselves under their doctor's guidance off of the medication without necessarily having a huge flare up, which is amazing. So if you have any questions, comments, or you'd love to see the resource, Sources associated with this episode. Head on over to skinterrupt.com forward slash 244 so we can keep the conversation going. And if this episode or the Healthy Skin Show in general has been helpful to you, I invite you to leave a review of the show on your podcast platform of choice. That way you can help support others seeking the same knowledge that you are benefiting from. And don't forget to subscribe to the show. That is so important so you don't miss the weekly doses of inspiration, client stories, strategies that you may not have heard at your doctor's office, and research and information like this to help you make more informed decisions and ultimately rebuild healthy skin. And let's connect over on social media. I'm at Jennifer Fugo. Thank you so much for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.